So thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, may I also first say how extremely grateful I am to President Ochi to be invited to visit uh, Hiroshima again. Uh, as has been said, I shall be permanently grateful uh, to Professor Kawamura for receiving me uh, over 50 years ago and introducing me to Japan. I've always had a, an enormously warm feeling for Japan ever since. And I would also like to say what an honor it is for me to speak uh, after Professor Yamanaka. I feel very insufficient compared to the enormous contribution that he has made. Indeed, the work that I have done would probably have no significant interest at all if it were not for the wonderful discovery uh, of Professor y Yamanaka. Now, I'm just going to mention again Toshijiro Kawamura, president of this university, and how extremely grateful I continue to be to him for having uh, introduced me here to Japan and a special pleasure to visit uh, Hiroshima again. Now, the subjects I would like to cover uh, are these four points to make. I will first say a few words about how stable differentiated cells arise in the embryo. I'll talk then about how differences between the cells can be reversed by nuclear transfer, and then a bit about the mechanism of stable, of reversal of stable cell differentiation. And I will then say a few words about the prospects of cell replacement, which really emphasizes entirely the enormous contribution of Professor Yamanaka. So the first point is to discuss how the different cells of the body come to arise. We know that we have many different kinds of cells in the body. How do they come from an egg? You may have seen in ponds round here that frog spawn starts as a mass of eggs. And in a few days, they turn into tadpoles, which swim around. Uh, these eggs have no instruction from the mother or anyone else. They somehow know how an egg, a single cell egg, can turn into a swimming larva. This has always been an amazingly interesting phenomenon. And for a long time, in the past centuries, people thought that the sperm had a little human body inside it, and the human would develop in the sperm and the egg and produce an individual. But if you look at the egg of a frog or any other animal, you cannot see any little human inside any more than you can in the sperm. We now know that there are two fundamental mechanisms for, by which these uh, single egg cells produce different kinds of cells. The first mechanism is an asymmetric distribution of determinants indicated by the yellow substances at one end of the egg and the blue ones at the other end. All eggs have an asymmetry when the egg is first fertilized. So you have some cells in the embryo with the blue so yellow substances, other cells with the blue substances. And soon after that, the blue cells send a signal to the yellow cells and make them change into something else. So this is the asymmetric distribution of determinant substances, followed by the signaling between the cells, blue to yellow, to make a third kind of cell. This idea of signaling is very fundamental in development. The idea is that there is a source of signal which 
reaches a high concentration around the cells near it, C cells, lesser concentration by, to the further away cells, and less still to others. And according to the concentration, these cells do different things, intestine, heart, brain, etc. And this fundamental point about signaling is well illustrated by the particular signaling substance active in, which was discovered in embryos by Makoto Asashima and J.C. Smith. As a matter of fact, the active in itself uh, was actually uh, first discovered, I understand, by Naoto Ueno, but these were the people that first realized its importance in development. And it is amazing how this substance can help switch cells from one fate to another uh, by this uh, ability of cells to sense a concentration. Now, if we look at the egg, fertilized egg, it normally develops into an embryo and then into a fetus, and then you get all these different sort of cells made. In fact, these cells are very stable. The whole process of cell differentiation is a very stable one. So, for example, nerve cannot change into heart, or muscle cannot change into intestine. Once the cells are formed, they stay that way for most of our life. So, just to summarize this first point, the uh, stable, stable cell type differences arise in normal development. The asymmetric differences uh, in the uh, exist in the cytoplasm of the fertilized egg, and the cells of the early embryo are already different from each other. Uh, these uh, uh, differences arise by signaling. That's the first message from this, uh, this talk about how, cells, how different kinds of cells arise in development, normal development. So cell differentiation is very stable, but it can be reversed by nuclear transfer and indeed by IPS. So we have to remember when this work first started in the 1950s, that's 50 years ago, it was not known whether all cells in the body have the same sets of genes. But this was why nuclear transfer was first developed as a method. And there were two questions. What are the components of eggs and embryos which can reprogram nuclei when you transplant a nucleus? How does the egg switch it back to an embryonic state? And secondly, what causes the resistance of somatic cell nuclei to these reprogramming factors. And as has been mentioned by Dr. Yamanaka, most cells do not readily respond. A few do, and those, that's wonderful, but many do not. So uh, let's now look at the nuclear transfer uh, technique. Uh, one starts with skin, separates the skin cells, and transplants the nucleus of such a cell to an egg. The egg chromosomes have been removed, and sometimes this egg and its skin nucleus can form an adult animal. Nowadays, this happens in other animals, in the mouse and many other uh, kinds of animals. That's the basic technique. And it was pioneered by uh, Briggs and King in the 1950s, uh, they did this with the American frog. But that frog was not the best species to use, and they were not able to get entirely normal development. When I started my work, I was lucky, because soon after starting, uh, I was able to obtain the first adult cloned animal. This is an adult Xenopus frog, um, and it was cloned, but it's, it was entirely normal. It lived for about 20 years, and it made about 5,000 offspring. 
So it's not true that cloned animals have to be abnormal. This one was completely normal. And indeed, you could make clones of animals. This was one of the first clones, transplant nuclei from a, an albino embryo to eggs of the wild-type animal. And all the clonal progeny come out, of course, albino, like the donor. And these are like identical twins. You can transplant skin between them uh, quite well. But the question is, how did Xenopus arise as a research organism? Interesting history. And the very first recording of Xenopus as a, an animal, they called it Bufo, was drawn in 1803. The interesting thing is the artist forgot to put on claws, special claws, which the frog has. Uh, so it was inaccurate, but that was the earliest picture of Xenopus. And later on, uh, people started growing Xenopus in the laboratory. Compared to the fantastic amphibian facility I have seen in Hiroshima, this is very primitive. The, uh, a man who happened to be called Mr. Budget uh, decided to put a beaker on a Bunsen burner, warm it up, and grow his tadpoles in, in that beaker. But that was, things have changed a great deal over the years. As a matter of fact, the history of how Xenopus came to be used in the laboratory is itself curious. Lawrence Hogben was a man who wrote books of many subjects, and he wanted to uh, earn more money. So he took a job in South Africa. He was actually English, and they paid him a big salary. And so he could do some work on the African species available to him, which was Xenopus. And then he decided to move back to England, where he took a job. And to continue his work, he needed to grow the Xenopus in the laboratory. So he rented uh, the, the crypt, the underground part of a chapel, and he used to make money by testing uh, the pregnancy of young ladies who wanted their circumstance to be private, for which he charged a fee. And then people realized that Xenopus was very useful because a hormone injection would make it lay eggs, and it became the favored animal for amphibian research at that time. So this was pure piece of good fortune, curious piece of luck, that it happened to become a popular laboratory animal. My own supervisor, uh, in a very clever way, discovered a mutant uh, by which the cells have uh, uh, one nucleolus, one set of chromosomes in their nuclei, compared to the wild type that have two. And this was a most important uh, discovery, which was immensely valuable for the work on Xenopus. So turning now to the question of can you really uh, uh, revert, make, cause a reversion from a specialized state to the embryo state, it was decided to take the intestine of a tadpole. The, the color is the food in the tadpole, though the cells were actually GFP marked. And when you transplanted nuclei from these intestine cells, you usually find that the early embryos are completely abnormal. A few normal cells, but most of the embryos are abnormal. And these embryos die. But it, if you take some of these cells and re-transplant the nucleus again to another set of eggs, you often end up with essentially normal tadpoles. And this is a case here where nuclei from intestine cells GFP marked, uh, were used, uh, grafted, and they have been part of some host tadpoles where the host cells, muscle cells, are not marked. The green ones are marked, and they came from intestine. So they were able to switch fate from intestine to muscle. In other work, the same thing has been done uh, for the eye, and here we have 
a tadpole derived from an intestine nucleus looking almost the same as one derived by fertilization. And when you look at the eye of this tadpole, it's an essentially normal eye with lens, reti layers of retina, but all of these cells, uh, including the lens, the iris, and the retinal layers, uh, were previously part of an intestine cell. Again, illustrating the switch from one fate to another caused by nuclear transfer. So when we look at this, we find that the nuclear transfer procedure shown does sometimes produce normal animals, but most of the time it's not very successful. Only about 2% of all of the nuclear transfers of skin will form an adult animal. Now, this work has been greatly extended in the meantime, and here is an example of what has happened uh, since those early times. Take a monkey, uh, take the skin cell of that monkey, and inject the nucleus into an egg from another monkey, uh, make the embryo, and then following the great discovery of Martin Evans, you make stem cells, embryonic stem cells from these embryo cells, expand them, and they can be uh, grown and factors added to make these embryonic stem cells form things like beating heart. And here is a, a, a picture from the work of Byrne, uh, who is doing this work. Um, and uh, I hope in a moment you can see the, as Shino Yamanaka has said, you can see the the, the uh, beating muscle cells, a whole sheet of them, all derived from skin. So that uh, illustrates so nicely the ability of the nuclear transfer and indeed other roots to make switch cells switch cell fate. I always like to quote this experiment of Wakayama, one of the most respected scientists uh, in this country, and what he did was to take a mouse and take the cumulus cells of the mouse, transplant the nucleus to an egg of the mouse, and grow another mouse. He then took the cumulus cells from this mouse and transplanted them, its nucleus again, to another egg and make another mouse. And in the end, he did this for 25 serial nuclear transfer generations. That means about 500 cell divisions from the first donor nucleus. And it implies that a body nucleus, somatic nucleus, really has an infinite lifespan. As long as you keep transplanting the nucleus back to an egg, it never dies. It goes on making progeny forever. And interestingly, he found that there is no loss of viability by this serial transfer, but also no cancer incidence. So there is this ability of the egg to form continuously proliferating cells, which go on forever and do not make cancer. So there's something very special about the egg. And since then, um, uh, Wilmot and colleagues have done the same work with the sheep. This is the first cloned mammal, the sheep, uh, they gave it a name, Dolly, Dolly the sheep. And uh, it was a very valuable sheep because they only got one out of two or three hundred nuclear transfers, and so it had to be grown indoors in case someone would steal it and put its skeleton in a museum. And that's why it lived to about six years because of the respiratory problems of growing the sheep indoors. But it was, again, uh, essentially an entirely normal sheep. So let's draw conclusions from these single nuclear transfers. Nearly all cells of the body have a complete genome. That was the single important conclusion. The egg cytoplasm has a remarkable ability to reprogram gene expression back to an embryonic state. Nevertheless, as cells differentiate, their nuclei become increasingly resistant to reprogramming by eggs. 
So that's the second message from this talk. Let me now turn to what we can say about mechanisms. Uh, obviously, when you develop a method or technique, you want to know how it works and why it works. So we're really interested in what it is that the egg has that can rejuvenate the nucleus of a body cell. So we'll talk now a bit about mechanisms of reprogramming, and I shall be talking about the particular cell type called an oocyte, a progenitor egg. So this is the nuclear transfer method I've talked about. Here you transplant the somatic cell nucleus, like a skin cell nucleus, into an egg, and you grow the embryo, and sometimes the embryo falls and forms an adult frog. However, after nuclear transfer, there is a phase of multiple cell divisions when the transplanted nucleus undergoes DNA replication only and no transcription. It doesn't express genes at that time. And during this replication process, because it's so rapid, there are replication errors in the transplanted nuclei. Now, that has the effect of causing much chromosome damage. Here are normal, chromo normal chromosome set, and here are the chromosomes of a nuclear transplant embryo, long broken chromosomes, fragments of one sort or another. So those chromosomes are abnormal, and they cause a high amount of abnormality in the transplanted nuclei and embryos. The way around this problem is to transplant nuclei into the oocyte. Now, the oocyte is the progenitor of an egg. It's the cell in the ovary, which uh, makes, uh, makes an egg eventually. And it has um, a very special uh, nucleus called the germinal vesicle, a large specialized nucleus. You can inject transplant nuclei into this special germinal vesicle, and when you do that, there is no DNA replication and no broken chromosomes, but there is a lot of transcription. And these same nuclei will now switch, as in reprogramming, from an adult stage to new gene expression. And that's the technique that is really useful for understanding what these components are. This shows the oocyte, the growing egg cell, takes a long time to grow from a germ cell to an adult oocyte and eventually an egg. And this oocyte has special substances in the germinal vesicle the part of the oocyte to which we transplant nuclei. These substances uh, get transferred to the egg and eventually to the embryo, and they are necessary for normal development. So this cell has a reserve of developmentally important substances, and by doing nuclear transfer into those, we try to find out what they are. When you do this kind of experiment, nuclei into this part of the oocyte, the, the nuclei are rapidly uh, uh, reprogrammed, very quickly if they're embryonic stem cell nuclei, more slowly if they're adult ones. But the main point is that in this procedure, you end up with about 95% of the transplanted nuclei undergo a change. So what is that? What is the cause of that? We now know that one of the most important things that happen when you transplant a nucleus is an exchange of the linker histones. So this is uh, showing you a picture of the uh, an adult uh, nucleus, adult nucleus. These have uh, histones covering the genes, which are marked with GFP. And the receiving oocyte 
has uh, red fluorescent protein marked substances. And as you see from this video, all these nuclei will switch from the green component to the red component. Here is a picture taken by my colleague Jérôme Julien, and you can see that almost all of the what were green nuclei are now red. They have taken up this special substance which makes them switch from an adult to embryo stage. And this switch happens within about two hours, very quick, and it happens in all the nuclei. This is followed by a switch in a whole lot of other components. All these molecules are changed. All these nuclei take up these different sorts of nuclei, including the polymerase. And to summarize that, we can say that these are the something to do with the mechanism of reprogramming. So here's the first thing I showed, the histone, linker histone B4, which takes place within about three hours. And then there are other histones, the histone H3.3, uh, his modified histones come in, and actin polymerization remarkably happens soon after that. The discovery, actually, of Kei Miyamoto, who is now working in this country in uh, Kinki University. We think what happens is that the chromatin, the genes in the adult, are closely connected to each other by nucleosomes. The first histone separates them, opens them up, and introduces a space. This space is then occupied by another kind of histone called H3.3, and that then brings in the RNA polymerase, which now transcribes the new genes. So that seems to be something about how the mechanism works. And this is critically dependent on the egg having a very large concentration of these reprogramming substances. So to conclude uh, this section, we say gene activation and mechanisms of reprogramming. The first thing is that we do nuclear transfer to these oocytes, and this can give about 95% reprogramming in a short time. The reprogramming by oocytes is not stochastic or random. It's a sequence of events, hierarchical sequence of events, and Importantly, the required molecules are at a very high concentration in the oocyte or egg. That seems to be why they work. So let me now come to the third point that I'd like to talk about. And this is resistance to reprogramming, which is much the same as the stability of cell differentiation. And I, at the beginning of the talk, I said that one of the most important things about cell differentiation is the stability. Cells, st stable, differentiation is very stable. It's interesting, of course, that most cells do not respond to the famous Yamanaka IPS factors. Some do, and that's immensely important. But the fact is that most cells um, are not reprogrammed by egg cytoplasm, nor reprogrammed by Yamanaka factors. So there's something very stable about the differentiation of these cells. So what kind of mechanisms might account for that? One well-known one is the methylation of DNA. I'm not going to say much about that, because that does affect some genes, but doesn't affect all. There is then the interesting phenomenon of epigenetic memory. I'll say a word or two about that. And the main point is that body cells have a memory of their background or their ancestry. So if you take skin cells, the embryos resulting from the skin cell nuclear transfers have some memory that they were once uh, uh, in the skin, and likewise muscle. 
Now, eggs and sperm have no such memory, and that may be why they uh, work almost perfectly. When a sperm enters the egg, 99% of them develop entirely normally. So the sperm is specially uh, designed to respond to egg factors. So what about this memory? Here is an experiment that shows you what happens if you take uh, a regular tadpole and take a muscle cell, transplant the muscle cell nucleus into an egg, like we've said, by nuclear transfer, grow the embryo, and then you take away the part of the embryo that will form muscle. So we're starting with muscle, and you take away the future muscle cells. But what you find, surprisingly, is that the cells that are now going to be nerve, or indeed gut, express muscle genes to a quite high extent, far more than they normally would. Normally, muscle genes are not expressed in the nerve or skin. It's only because the transplanted muscle cell nucleus seems to remember that its ancestors were part of a muscle cell. Now, this phenomenon is best explained by eliminating another histone, which we've just mentioned, one called H3.3. If you eliminate that, then you find there is no memory of the muscle state. So we know something about that. But it does mean that even though you transplant a nucleus to an egg and it undergoes reprogramming, there is this persistent memory we would like to be able to remove that memory efficiently and so improve the success of reprogramming. And as uh, Shinya Yamanaka has said, a real aim is to grow lots of transformed, uh, of reprogrammed cells without having to deal with these enormous numbers, like 10 to the 11. And if we could make the reprogramming work as efficiently as the egg does, this could be very useful. So I'll just go on and talk now a little bit about transcription factors. These are the cells, or these are the factors which tell cells what to become. So there are factors for nerve, factors for muscle. And this is an area of current research. And the question we ask is what concentration and for how long does a factor need to be present in cells for it to determine a cell fate decision? Is there an exchange rate? And it may well be that the slow exchange of transcription factors may create resistance and stabilize the differentiated state. So we're now asking how stably are transcription factors bound to chromatin? And uh, can this stable transcription factor binding contribute to stability? This experiment is done using the oocyte in a particular competition experiment, injecting genes in plasmids, competing them out. And uh, in effect, you have to use these artificial genes to investigate the problem. We have put them into the oocyte together with other genes. And here are the preliminary conclusions. This is that under conditions of equal concentration, competitor DNA will not displace transcription factor DNA that's already bound to chromatin. So under these conditions, transcription factor residence is stable over many hours. And we have to conclude that stable transcription factor residence on chromatin helps to promote stability of cell lineage. So that raises the next question, which is, uh, is there a time when transcription factors change. And it turns out that there is a special window of opportunity for a change in gene transcription during mitosis, when cells divide. This experiment is done like this. As we've said, you uh, transplant nuclei to the oocyte, and you can then test nuclei in different phases of the cell cycle. So you can, for example, isolate nuclei in, the mit in mitosis. These are isolated nuclei in mitosis. 
And if you transplant those, surprisingly, some genes, like SOX2, are enormously more activated, reprogrammed, than is true if you use nuclei and other cell cycle phases. You can see here the, the uptake of the reprogramming components is very strong in a mitotic nucleus, not at all in an interphase nucleus. And so let's reach the conclusion from this uh, brief comments that I've made. So mitotic advantage, that's what we call this, mitotic advantage is best explained in part by a chemical process called the deubiquitination of histone, particular histones. This probably has a loosening effect on nucleosome composition or binding to DNA, and so decreases the resistance to reprogramming, and so increases stability of cell dif differentiation. So the concept from this kind of work, which is one of the things that people are doing in nuclear transfer, is to understand how you can change a cell from a stable differentiated type, like skin or muscle, into an embryonic one, and so bring about uh, reprogramming. So the overall concept here is the following. I talked about asymmetric distribution of determinants in eggs, and we think this happens at cell division. So here is a cell, and in the cytoplasm of the cell, there, is, uh, there are gene-activating molecules, like transcription factors. This is a stem cell in which these factors increase and then they increase more, and when that stem cell divides, there are lots of these factors, and they always go to one end of the parental cell. So when this cell divides, as is usually the case, it makes another stem cell. You see, stem cells make two cells, one of which is another stem cell, and the other cell, which is smaller, will make a specialized cell like skin. And these factors go to the specialized cell, small cell, and so reach a high concentration. And it's the asymmetric distribution of these factors, rather as happens in eggs, which seems to make stem cells produce some specialized cells and other stem cells. That's the overall concept. Now, before I move on to the last part of the talk, I just want to acknowledge some of my colleagues because the next part of the talk will be nothing to do with nuclear transfer. And the colleagues I'd like to mention are these, and most notably, we have Kei Miyamoto, who is now working in this country, Kinky University, and Jerome Julian, both of whom are, I'm pleased to say, able to be at this meeting, and who have been enormously helpful in all this work that I've talked about. So, we now come to the last part of this talk, and as you can imagine, when I talk about work with frogs, people think of something different. They, nobody really cares what happens about a frog. So you have to say, are the principles that have come about from this work actually useful to patients? And here we're really, of course, working almost entirely on the enormously important work that Shino Yamanaka and colleagues have done. So I'm going to talk about this, uh, even though I hope that some of the principles of nuclear transfer may still apply. So uh, I think we've already had mention of this disease. It's called age-related macular degeneration, uh, and it means that people, as they get older, very often have deteriorating vision. They can't see properly, and eventually they go blind. And this is a, a, quite a common problem for elderly people. Uh, I should just say there is a, one form of macular degeneration which is called dr uh, dry. This one is incurable. There's another one called wet, which uh, to some extent is curable. But this is the serious one, the dry form of macular degeneration leading to blindness. And this is how it looks. Uh, if you can see 
perfectly well at one point, you then get a patch, and Sunni Yamanaka, I think, has shown this, where you just can't see in the middle at all. Eventually, you, here you can see the periphery, uh, and um, eventually you go blind. So it's a very uh, troublesome disease in every way. Now, what happens in this case with this age-related macular degeneration is that the rods and cones of the photoreceptor cells, these are the rods and cones, are adjacent uh, in contact with the retinal pigmented epithelium, which are these cells. These are the retinal pigmented epithelium cells in normal life. Now, in the diseased case, the retinal pigmented epithelium cells die, and that causes the rods and cones of the photoreceptor cells also to die because these are needed as support cells, and so eventually the rods and cones of photoreceptor cells deteriorate and blindness results. Now, the technology which Shin Yamanaka has mentioned depends critically on his great discovery, and what you can do with his IPS route is to produce replacement retinal pigmented epithelium. Here are the new retinal pigmented epithelium cells. They can be reproduced by IPS, as indeed they can by other mechanisms such as nuclear transfer. And what can be done, or is being done, both in this country and in, uh, in England and some other places, is to make a replacement retinal pigmented epithelium. This is all replacement, and it can be derived from adult cells. These cells are present as a sheet. Here is a monolayer of these retinal pigmented epithelium cells. This is actually the work of Professor Coffey in London, but others do the same thing. And you have a little bit of plastic, about three millimeters by six millimeters, and this sheet of cells as a monolayer on the plastic can be surgically introduced into the back of the eye. And in principle, it's a rather straightforward procedure, much like uh, a cataract replacement. But we have to remember one thing, and that is that cell numbers are very important. And Professor Yamanaka has mentioned this. So a human, like all of us, have about 10 to the 13 cells. A human heart is, say, 5 times 10 to the 11. And if you have a heart, serious heart failure, you would lose about 10 to the 11 cells. Now, fortunately, the retinal pigmented epithelium of the eye, you only need 50,000 cells to bring about this uh, successful replacement. So there's a huge benefit to starting this work with the eye. Um, and, and that's why this is the work that is currently fairly close to being, I believe, available to patients. So when I tell people this, they all say, well, that sounds fantastic. They all say, I have a, a husband, aunt, relation, or someone who is going blind. Uh, and they say, why can't we have this treatment now? The fact is, they can't. Why not? Um, and these are the problems. They're not really scientific problems. They're administrative problems. So for example, surgical treatment of any kind in humans needs approval by regulatory bodies. These are committees of people who decide whether a procedure can be used for patients. The regulatory bodies are extremely conservative. That's to say they don't want to take any risk at all. If there's any remote possibility of a risk, they say the procedure is not allowed to be used. So patients can't have this. You can actually bypass regulatory bodies if you sign away your legal rights. Uh, that's technically possible. But lawyers, who are the problem, they will say, they are not convinced that you have informed consent. 
they will say, the person who says, I'm going blind, I'll be happy to have this replacement. The lawyer says, I'm not sure that you really understood the procedure. And so it's blocked, largely by lawyers. So these are some of the ethical and legal issues, which I would say are entirely different from the scientific issues. So here are legal issues. People will say, what about the liability of the hospital or surgeon? Could it be that a patient who has this treatment is not satisfied and will then run a law case against the hospital or the surgeon? Well, that's a, a sort of a non-scientific problem and it has to be dealt with. Others will say, well, should the National Health Service pay for this, uh, and that delays discussion. The National Health Service, which you have here, as we do in England, should be prepared to pay for this because the cost of a blind person is something like $20,000 per year. This technique, when it's running, would be a lot less than that. Are you allowed to pay privately? Well, that's a, an ethical problem. Some people will say, if, if a rich person can pay for it and a poor person can't, you shouldn't be allowed to have the procedure at all. That's a kind of uh, another issue. And then, uh, finally, the question is, who should decide uh, these matters? Um, should it be uh, the patient? I would say myself that the patient should be allowed to take a decision whether to have such a procedure, and even if the regulatory bodies have not finally approved the procedure, the patient should be allowed to choose. That would be my personal view. So uh, who decides? Some people will say lawyers should decide, others say priests, others say politicians, or I would say the patients should be allowed to decide whether they will have such a treatment. Um, and the treatment is currently being tested in many cases, and it should really be available at the present time, in my view. So here is a summary of the talk I've given. What I've said is that nearly all cells of the body have the same set of genes. And remember that if that had not been the case, this whole concept of cell replacement would not be possible. We're very lucky that evolution happened to decide that when cells differentiate, they don't lose genes, they have the same genes. So in principle, you can derive one cell type from another. Uh, we've mentioned that specialized cells of one kind can be reprogrammed to other unrelated cell types. This can be done by natural components of eggs and oocytes, and eventually we'd like to know in detail how that works. But in the meantime, it's a wonderful, great achievement of Shinya Yamanaka that his brilliant IPS route does in fact um, achieve reprogramming. So my final, final conclusion from this talk is that the replacement of some kinds of aged or non-functional cells in humans is a real prospect in the near future as long as, and this is the point, ethicists and lawyers do not interfere. This is the problem. So I see these wonderful advances, like Shinya Yamanaka has described, being held up by the worst of all the lawyers who are using c compensation threats to delay the availability of these techniques, wonderful techniques, to patients. So that's the end of the talk. Thank you. Stay here. Stay here, right, yes. Now, yes, that would be rather useful if we try and... Thank you, John. So now, oh.
あそれではあの、えー、と質疑応答の時間としたいと思いますので、一応、十分、えー、時間を取っているので、えー、と質疑応答を質問を受け付けたいと思います。えー、ちょっとあの話が、えー、とサイエンティックな部分は、ちょっと高校生諸君には、えー、一部難しかった部分もあったと思うんですけども、あのキーワードとしては、エピジェネティクスという言葉が、まあ、現在の,の生物学の生命科学の論語のキーワードとしてなっているんですけども、諸君の ATGC という言葉は、ATGC という遺伝暗号が今知っていると思うんですけども、えっと、遺伝子というものは、えっと、裸であるわけではなくて、必ずそのタンパク質、ヒストンというタンパク質に絡み合って、それでその遺伝子がオープンだったり、クローズだったりと、閉じてたりという状態があって、それを制御しているのがエピジェネティックイベントと言われているもので、その ATGC の配列によらずに、そういったヒストンの、絡まっているヒストンのタンパク質のメチルカとか、メチルカとか、メチルカとか、メチルカとか、メチルカとか、メチルカとか、メチルカとか、メチルカとか、メチルカとか、メチルカとか、メチルカ Changes or control the opening or closing of the chromatin regimes. And this is one of the latest studies being done in biology or life science. Anyhow, I would like to invite questions, some scientific questions, and then we would like to have. Some question concerning the future therapeutic possibilities. You may raise your questions in English or in Japanese. And we have Dr. Miyamoto, who was referred to in Dr. Gurdon's speech, is there, and he might be able to help you if you are going to ask in Japanese. So please raise your hand. ここ生が、あのこちらのメガネから。え、それであの高校生から質問があります。山本さんよろしくお願いします。え、それであの高校生から質問があります。山本さんよろしくお願いします。え、それであの高校生から質問があります。山本さんよろしくお願いします。え、
So even with nuclear transfer, muscle cells are generated. Epigenetic memory. I wonder whether epigenetic memory can cause cancer generation, initiation of cancer through the nuclear transfer. Can cause cancer, right? Sorry, yes. Sorry, yes. Uh, um, I, I think it is possible. You better translate my response. Um, I, I think that is possible, but there are so many other problems with cancer, including non epigenetic changes. It's difficult to be sure how much epigenetic changes itself is responsible for it. Does that make sense? Yes. Oh, yeah, sorry, of course. You... <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I should apologize for being unable to speak Japanese. When I first came to the country in 1962, I did take a course in Japanese, and uh, I was able to um, at least uh, re read the simple Japanese writing. Otherwise, how did I know where I was going? But you, as you get older, you, you tend to forget. Uh, so I'm sorry to be unable to communicate properly in Japanese. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um. Thank you very much. Well, I've explained to that student later. Uh, uh, a girl there. Uh, I see hands raised by women. Women in Hiroshima are very active, I guess. Okay, uh, uh, my name is uh, Regina. I'm a master student belong to Institute for Amphibian Biology. And my question is, uh, I'm very interested with the ability of the oocyte that could reprogram the somatic nucleus into the embryonic features. And then we also know that uh, Yam Professor Yamanaka discovered that there are four factors that could induce differentiated cell into the pluripotent cells. So are the four of this factor are included in the oocyte? So oocyte it can reprogram uh, the somatic nucleus. Uh, this cell. Yeah, first of all, she was impressed by the oocyte can reprogram somatic nuclear. Did the oocyte use the same factor as the Yamanaka factor? Oh, I see. Yes, That's same question. Yes. OK, so I understand. It's a very good question. Good question. Does the egg or oocyte have the same uh, uh, situation as the Yamanaka factors? We think the answer is no, because we have tested most of the Yamanaka factors in the egg system and they do not seem to have any effect except for one. Most of them have no effect. So we think the egg works by an entirely different route uh, using some of the components we've mentioned. So probably the common Yamanaka factors do not contribute to the reprogramming by the egg or oocyte. There's one slight exception, but most have no effect whether you overexpress them or underexpress them. So probably the egg is using a, an entirely different system. Uh, at least that's what we think at the moment. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So the and uh, this is going to be the last question. Thank you for all nice lecture and I'm I'm Sakura Inoue from Motomachi High School, and we'll be the medical student in Hiroshima University from next spring. And, no, and my question I'm, is, I'm could you tell school. me how to make the cell seed from the, from, by differentiation, by differentiate the stem cells? Question about your uh, retina 
to the mail to Sir Reyes. The, the retinal cells. The retinal cells. cells. How you can you make the cell sheet of the retinal pigmented cells? How you make the cell? How you make the cell sheet yes, for the transplantation? Yes, the yes, thank you. How to make the retinal pigmented sheet? This is done uh, by the Yamanaka procedure, starting either from ES cells or other cells, and then factors are added rather like I indicated, you can add factors to make heart cells and so on. Actually, the cells uh, that are used particularly like to go into a neural cell direction. That's their preferred direction. So it's not very difficult to be able to convert uh, the available cells, like uh, ES cells or other cells, into the uh, retinal pigmented type. They rather like to go that way, and that's a piece of good fortune, but that, by the people who do the work, is not said to be the most difficult problem. Perhaps the most serious problem would be getting enough cells uh, for this procedure. And the thing that I should have mentioned that's very important is that when you do this procedure, the transplanted cells do not divide so the problem that Srinayana Manaka has mentioned of possible cancer, this seems unlikely to be a problem for the retinal pigmented um, replacement. The cells, once they're transplanted, they don't divide, and you don't need such a large number. But the problem of making cells like ES cells into the retinal pigmented cells is not, not, not that difficult. They, they tend to go that way. So that's the relatively simpler part, and the problem at the moment seems to be numbers of cells and the problem of regulatory bodies holding it up. Eventually they will allow the procedure, but at the moment, it's at least in, in, in Britain, in our country, that's a significant problem, the delay caused by regulatory bodies who are very frightened by lawyers. So time is up, unfortunately.